change this view there we go cool cool how's it going man uh it's going very well i just how's got back from a hike in uh beautiful las vegas nevada oh right on very very cool i thought you were in california i was uh, i lived in los angeles for about 12 years and just moved to las vegas a month and a week ago so very cool i used to live in reno and uh, I grew up in Santa Cruz, California. Nice. Yeah, now I'm where, in Ontario. Where are you now? Oh, geez. I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm close to Toronto, Ontario, just nice. about an hour and a half outside. I was actually just in Toronto last year uh, for a big event and was also up there for the Festival of Friends, which is a huge music concert uh, up there, and got to see Loverboy live. <laughs> That's rad. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. I miss, see, I, I miss festivals so much. This is such a bummer. So the whole reason that I'm online now and, and doing all this is that uh, before COVID, I would read tarot at every festival uh, and that was just my gig and I loved it, you know, and I, and I did very well and now there's no more festivals. Right. <laughs> so I've right. got to take the whole business online and I see. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Cause it's, I'm focusing on, you know, stuff that I had been neglecting, which is like my online presence. Yeah. You know, and doing this podcast, which is something I've always wanted to do. Hey, everybody has an online presence now, because if you don't, you don't exist. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right, man. So I kind of I have a few questions for you that I, I want to ask. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I want it to be more of a conversation than an interview, but just whatever, nah. whatever happens, happens. Um, I'm really excited to meet you and talk to you because I love the Occult Tarot deck. It's, it's fantastic. It's Thank really you. cool. Um, I you. use it more for magical purposes than for divination right. purposes. And I think that that's probably what a lot of people end up doing with it because it's, and it's a powerful deck. Uh, and, and after you, yeah, that story. So that's <laughs> fascinating because as soon as we made our arrangement to do this interview, I mean, a moment later, my fire alarm went off. It was wow. very strange. And then when I messaged you to tell you that happened, it did it again. <laughs> and there's Very no weird. smoke in my house. It was, yeah. Um, but weird stuff like that is kind of always happening around. Well, me, I, so. I, I've got some interesting stories about things that happened to me when I was creating that deck. And I'll, I'll tell you some of the stories, but they have affected me so profoundly that I only use that deck once a year. That's how... Um, uh, powerful I feel the deck is that I the creator don't even use it very often um, I'm, I'm really really conservative and I never do readings for other people with it because uh, I'm relatively uh, new in my journey as a magician and I feel like I've matured pretty quickly in that journey but I would never take a chance and expose somebody else uh, to to powers that you know I feel comfortable controlling uh, for myself but I don't necessarily feel comfortable yet controlling them for other people or, or, you know, to sort of benefit other people. So, yeah. So that, that deck is, it has got a lot of interesting energy charged around it. Uh, I fully agree. I really do. When I first pulled it out of the box and did, you know, anytime I get a new deck, uh, I shuffle through it. I get familiar right. with it, you know, and it just, the vibration that I could feel in my body was completely right. unfamiliar to me. <laughs> It was interesting. It was new. It wasn't the normal vibe I get from any of my other decks. Um, and it was, I got to say, it was a little bit scary. Uh, and what I ended up doing was placing the uh, Baphomet, which corresponds to the Magician, which also corresponds right. to my Life Path number sure. on my altar. And, uh, you know, I have a few offerings out there and I, I pray at that altar every day and things have been going my way. Sure. <laughs> they really have. It's been, it's been wonderful. Uh, a lot of people have told me very similar stories, each one with a different card, you know, representing a different demon. 
And for myself, the, the, the demon that I was initially drawn to when I created the deck was uh, Andros, the um, you know, murderous uh, uh, owl-headed boy, angel boy, uh, uh, who, who slays the master and his apprentices if, if you can't control him properly. So that was the card that I was most drawn to when I created the deck. But once the deck was made and I did the very first reading with it, Lucifuge Rofakal, who is actually not one of the uh, Goetic demons, he's one of the, what I call Grand Princes of Hell. He's actually the Prime Minister of Hell uh, from the Grand Grimoire. But I developed this weird relationship with that, with that card and with that demon. And, and I don't know, I, I've had very similar uh, um, sort of, you can call it good luck, I guess. I, I don't know if that's the right word for it. But since I've been sort of exalting that, uh, that card with his image on it, I don't know, it's, it, things have, have changed for me in really significant ways. And I actually just recently commissioned an artist um, who had found me through Instagram, through my decks and everything, uh, to paint a painting that has Lucifuge Rofakal's sigil embedded in the painting. And it's massive, it's, it's humongous. And uh, she just finished it uh, last week and she mailed it to me uh, here a couple of days ago. So I'm hoping to have it on my wall in, in a few days, but it's, it's amazing. And even she said, while she was creating that painting, like somehow the color green, it's all black and red and gray. And somehow the color green kept coming out of these flames she was making on the painting. And green happens to be Lucifuge Rofakal's color, but she didn't use any <laughs> green in the painting. So it's like, okay, uh, if I didn't want to buy this before, I definitely have to buy it now. <laughs> That's fantastic. That, I see, I love stories of synchronicity. Um, I, I love, man, I just love talking about this stuff. It is so fascinating to me. And I got to say, I'm surprised to hear you say that you're new to magic because your knowledge of magic, yeah, I mean, I, I watched a bunch of your videos today yeah, uh, to yeah. prepare for this interview and I you seem to really know what you're doing. So I'll, I started, the, the reason that I say I'm new to it is because I'm new to it as a practicing magician. So I had been studying magic and studying the occult and reading these uh, sort of old grimoires since I was like, I don't know, 16 or 17 years old. That's 96 or 97. So, I mean, we're going on what, 23 years or so now um, that I spent studying and, and I didn't know I was building a foundation to actually perform those magic acts. Um, I just wanted to know what the history of it was and you know, was there any truth to this? Is it real? but I never really had the courage to actually start working with it myself. So when the time came for me to start doing these summoning rituals, I think the reason that I was so successful at it right away was because I already understood um, everything the previous magicians in the past had put into these rituals. And I knew what was important and I knew what could be left out and I knew what applied to me and what maybe, you know, you don't really have to slaughter a black chicken and use its blood to <laughs> consecrate your workspace. You can do that, but it's not absolutely necessary. And to see, you know, what's the analog to that, that, that I could use in, in modern day to, to try and make that work. So yeah, I had studied for many, many years with no intention of ever being a practicing occultist. And, and then two and a half, almost three years ago now, I started actually doing the ritual work and everything changed. My literally, my entire life changed. It was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. That's how it happens, and that is why I am such an advocate for ritual magic, and right. for for occultism, for for understanding this stuff, and understanding that there really is something going on here because it will change your life. It changed my life, changed your life. I mean, everybody I know who's gone through a powerful spiritual <laughs> waking awakening of any kind is is a transformed person. I, you know, I think back to the guy I was before my, my awakening and it's like, who was that guy? <laughs> wow. Um, you know, and, and my story is similar to yours in, in that I, well, I started studying this stuff and doing magic as a teenager, but I just did not take it that seriously. You know, I would do it 
the way that that some people will like instinctually pray like if something was terrible in my life i'd be like all right i'm doing magic because <laughs> i would be desperate but it would work and i would notice that it would work and that would freak me out um but i loved studying it and i also you know um so i lost my dad when i was 12 and i was i was i was mad about it you know and i, I went to church and i realized that this is just not what he believed in and not you know he, he thought the church was nonsense. So what am I doing here? Right? right. So I went out and grabbed a copy of uh, the satanic Bible by right. Anton LaVey. And I was really, I was really into that, that path for, yeah. you know, my teenage years, but that, right. you know, through that, that led me, that opened the doors to other things to hermeticism, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I'm, I'm a chaos magician. I don't have any one particular path, but right. I, I love the Kabbalion <laughs> and, and all my, the magic that I perform is performed through the hermetic principles right, right. um yeah so anyway so then uh, only about two three years ago now i started studying sacred geometry mm. and when i started studying sacred geometry i swear to god it was like when neo gets plugged into the matrix <laughs> it was just all i i can the only thing the only words i can use to describe it are you know what people call a kundalini awakening experience yeah. uh, an intense yeah. vibration that went all up and down my spine caused severe pain for a little while and it was just like buckets and buckets and buckets of information were being poured into my head all at once wow. and suddenly all the dots connected to everything i had been reading studying this stuff as a kid just reading it being like yeah okay that's cool and then going about you know my day all of a sudden it all just locked together and and i got it <laughs> and did you discover that through a book or was it um some kind of a, a course or something like that it was through me wanting to learn to draw ah and i was not okay. searching for sacred geometry i okay. was looking up regular geometry on youtube right. to learn right. to just i was bored and i wanted to draw and then I stumbled on a sacred geometry video and it just, right. you know, the sacred geometry creation story. And just yeah. the fact that the, the way the, the flower of life <clears throat> contains so much information, right. it, it's unreal. And so then I got yeah. the books by, uh, by Drunvalo and, and it kind of plowed my way through like new age <laughs> philosophy. Like I was just chowing down on it, <laughs> you know, and learning these things and then, and then connecting all these different dots. Right. And, and, and coming to the realization that it doesn't, and this is just my opinion, right? Like I'm not trying to step on yeah. anybody's path, but it, I know magicians of several different paths and they're all successful in their magic. So no one particular path is correct. Right. right? Or, or better, or, you know, I don't know. They're just, they're different. So I started pondering like, what is that? Right. And that's kind of been my quest ever since. And, and the way that I describe it now is just that, look, there is a metaphysical realm. Uh, you know, the new age crowd might call it the fourth dimension. Um, a hermeticist might call it the mental Actually, they're plane. calling it the fifth dimension now, I believe. <laughs> well, I, I was, was at a, uh, I was at a, a conference uh, earlier this year before they shut down conferences back in February. And I sat through a, a fifth dimensional seminar so yeah that's that and that seemed to be what almost everybody else was calling it as well <laughs> yeah but you know but it doesn't matter right like what it, these right. are all these different uh religious structures and and spiritual right. structures and even personal gnosis what i think you're doing is building a framework in your mind which is your your connection to the metaphysical realm and yes. and because yes. it's not physical we have to develop a language of symbolism in order to interact with it on a conscious level. So you could right. pick whatever symbolism works for you, yeah. right? It could be the Egyptian gods or the, the, uh, the uh, Goetic spirits, uh, you know, whatever works for you, whatever you're drawn the to, Olympian whatever you spirits, whatever with. it might be. Yeah. yeah, totally. And so you just, you know, you form your connection to the metaphysical realm in whatever way you can using right. whatever tools you can. And tarot is, in my opinion, oh. the tool it's like it really it's yeah. the it's a gateway to the other side and anybody yeah. can do it and and so many people consider tarot to be just a divination tool and i really look at it as a tool for self improvement oh and my, it's I, everything I, I think there have been some books written about about that how tarot is used for self improvement and i haven't read any of them but you know i've used it for myself for about i guess the past 7 years or so to help you know, guide me in a, on a month to month basis, you know, I try and do a, a monthly tarot reading 
with my my old rider weight deck mm-hmm. and just to say hey you know what sh- how should i focus my energies this month you know what should i what path should i be you know trying to to sort of push down and it's it's worked for me yeah um and so t- you know tarot is so many things it's a complete system of magic all on its yeah. own you can perform magic with it magic with it it's astrology and numerology are built into okay. one symbolic system there. So like if you have like a Thoth deck, for example, mm-hmm. you can really learn astrology through your tarot deck and numerology. Um, you know, so I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> Anyways, Just it's, how it's tarot like a complete, is such a useful it's, tool. Yeah, it's yeah. a complete system of magic. And it's yeah. I, I kind of refer to it as the witch's Bible because it's yeah. just it's like everything is in that is in those those cards <laughs> and they, um, it really is it really is and it, it takes um so much time i i had never even considered creating my own tarot deck until i had already spent years working with just the basic rider weight and a couple of other decks and um really really getting comfortable with what each card means on an astrological level on a um a, a zodiac level on a um a numerolo- numerological numerological level, <laughs> uh, every level that there can be, you know, and then of course yeah. the Kabbalistic level as well, which is is woven into there mm-hmm. uh, as as it just fits, you know. Yeah, and and it and the way that so many of these different languages of symbolism come together, like yeah. like the Kabbalistic tree of life and and the flower of life and sacred geometry and tarot, they're they're all interwoven in and out of each other, and I love it. That's so. That's what I was going to say was that it it became apparent to me, and that's why my brand mission <clears throat> is witchcraft for better mental mental health. It became apparent to me that when you learn these things, when you learn about astrology and numerology, you start to understand the why of what's going on around you, and that is it's it's priceless. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could start to understand the, your own patterns, the patterns of the people around you, the patterns of the universe, and start to discern what's really happening around you and, and take yourself out of that state of like chaos and into, I get it, I understand. Yeah. You know, learning your life path <clears throat> number, learning your destiny number, learning your even just your big three astrological signs. You know, most people only know their sun sign and that's why they think astrology is bullshit. Because they don't even realize that you're going to resonate more with your rising sign than your sun sign, most people. And they don't know their rising sign. So they're like, yeah, that's nonsense. But, you know, I challenge anyone out there listening who thinks that astrology is nonsense, you know, go to a real astrologer with an open mind and you will be blown away. And if you would like a recommendation for an astrologer, uh, see my friend Tawny at Tawny Michelle Terology on YouTube. I'll put a link down in the description. Yeah, I've got, you know, I'm a, I'm a Gemini, but I have a ton of cancer in my, in my, uh, my natal chart and it's like everywhere. And it's funny because all my friends, my close friends are mostly cancers. Uh, my mom's a cancer. A lot of the, the girls that, and guys that I've dated over the years were cancers. And actually three of my closest friends are not just cancers. They have the exact same birthday. None of them know, you know, they didn't know each other until I introduced them. Uh, but, but isn't that, and, and who the hell knew I was a Gemini, but I look at my natal chart, I've got cancer everywhere. I think it's Mm -hmm. my Venus sign and my rising sign. Um, and it's like everywhere. And then I've got all these cancers in my life and I'm like, Hmm, maybe I, I, I had all these friends before I realized what my, what, that there was other stuff in my chart besides just being a Gemini. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, it's all, and it's all there and a great astrologer can tell you so much about yourself. It's incredible. And in your numerology as well, I'm fascinated by numerology. Uh, I think life paths are, are incredibly useful for people. Uh, and, you know, if, especially if you're looking for direction in your life, look at your life path number, look at your destiny number. There's your direction. <laughs> uh, or, you know, there's a lot of potential in there, but it, it can steer you. Um, and it certainly steered me in the right direction. I mean, everybody needs a path and there's nothing wrong with um, using that as a method, especially if you don't know what you're going to do with your life, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, I just, I love, you know, and that's why I think that the term uh, know thyself is so prevalent in esoteric yeah. culture, right? Cause it's so, and that's what this stuff is. You learn about yourself and, yeah. you know, and this is, again, this is just my personal belief system and, and my uh, way of thinking things, but <clears throat> do you ever play video games? 
Uh, yeah. Okay. So, right. Like I'm not a big gamer, but I know that when you play, I really love this video game called Mass Effect. All right. Okay. okay. And at the I know, but, these, but I've never played it. <laughs> the, at the beginning of these kinds of games, you build a character and right. you choose the character's backstory and you you choose the way they look and all this stuff right i feel like that's what your soul did with you and that's what you are and then right. and you can find what your your character is in your astrology and your numerology it's all laid out there right and it and to me it's direct uh, you know the word proof is like whatever but to me direct you know objective evidence that the universe does work in patterns and that the patterns right. are discernible to us if we if we learn about them right yeah, if you're able to see them and able to, you know, have the 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 background knowledge to pick pick out the patterns when they occur. Right? Yeah, and and to, to notice synchronicity when it occurs and stop calling it coincidence. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I I it, a lot of the stuff we're talking about is is uh, part of something I am developing called a unified theory of metaphysics. And well, I think we're working um, on the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the thing is, I hope a lot of people are. Yeah, I, it's, it's happening. Because there's so many different little parts to it. I think that if we all came together and sort of shared what our own research is, and our own experiences, uh, we might be able to find those same patterns that are occurring across our work. And I think uh, we are divided by a language. You know, we don't have a common language of metaphysics. And like you said, you know, what one person calls a demon, another person might call an angel or a genie or the, or a genius yes. uh, or an Olympian or, or whatever those a spirit, whatever those other words might be. Um, we're divided by that. And some of it's cultural, some of it's religious, uh, some of it might be academic, but I think it's mostly um, just those, those things that I want to say I'm right. And you, <laughs> and I want you to be wrong. Yeah. And uh and we got to overcome that so we can develop this unified theory that can maybe explain everything all in one kind of breath, you know, one, yeah. one fell swoop. Absolutely. Well, when we end this call, I will send you over some of my papers. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I would love to read it. I, cool. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah um, and that's kind of what I was saying. Like there is a metaphysical realm that is real and the language of symbolism that the individual develops to relate to that metaphysical realm, you know, that's, that's subjective and up to the individual. And, yeah. and I, I, I don't know, right. Like it's, it's so hard to say what is and what is it. And I don't want to be telling anybody what to believe, right. Just yeah. there, there is something out there and you can make contact with it in a variety of ways. And, and the other, the thing that I find very challenging is, um, not invalidating people's personal experiences because you know for example somebody saw bigfoot okay well i mean that, i don't feel like that has anything to do with with metaphysics necessarily but then they tell me well the bigfoot they saw disappeared into thin air okay now what do i do here i can either take what they've told me as truth or i can invalidate their experience and say well you didn't see that you you saw something else um even though i might respect and and trust that person so that those personal experiences, there's, there's something there. I don't know what it is. And you know what science does with, with personal anecdotes. It just throws them in the trash. It doesn't consider them evidence or, or um, really relevant at, at all. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, well, okay. So, I mean, science is so divided and so broken in so many ways. Um, because I would say that quantum physics are just another language of symbolism used to access the metaphysical realm. We're talking about the same stuff so too. here. I think so too. And, and I think that the further quantum physics develops, uh, the metaphysicians, people like us, I call yeah. this, uh, we have to be willing to accept some of those scientific discoveries and terms that are on that quantum level, because the quantum people are going to discover that some of the metaphysical stuff we've been uh, talking about and exploring and, and writing about is actually real and has a connection to that. Yeah. So and, I think um, we're going to come together and yeah. it, it, I mean, it might be in the next hundred years, who knows? Uh, but someday we will come together and stuff like time travel and uh, past life regression and stuff like that. And, and psychic phenomenon, all those things are we're going to find operate on the quantum level. Yes, absolutely. Uh, not, I mean, on the quantum level and also, 
on just the level of the the imperceivable by our excruciatingly right. limited <laughs> senses <laughs> you know we, we five, experience we five senses that's it <laughs> yeah we experience less than like 0.00001 percent right. of what's all around us all the time right, right. you know we're yeah. missing out on pretty much all the and then of that point like zero 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 one percent then your brain spreads an in a tremendous amount of energy filtering out all kinds yeah. of other stuff yep. and only focusing on what you, you know, what you see and what you, what you What's focus important. on, right? What's Think important. about the computing power that your mm-hmm. brain uses to ignore the sensation of your clothes against your skin. Cause after you pull on your shirt, you never think about, oh, I'm wearing a shirt ever again, you know, but your, your body is actually feeling that tactile sensation all day long. And exactly. your brain is saying, no, 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 we don't need to worry about that. Think about the computing power. <laughs> so what I think is going on here uh, is that you're, you know, you're, you've got your, your conscious thinking mind, you've got your subconscious mind, right? Your conscious right. thinking mind right. is like not really all that smart. Even if you're really, really, really smart, can you add eight numbers together at the same time? No, uh, no, right? no, but your subconscious mind is a quantum computer and it can do all kinds of amazing things, but you're not right. Like, are you thinking about how fast you beat your heart right now or? Your breathing pattern no not at all it's all this automatic it's coming from your subconscious mind you know um so your subconscious is definitely kind of the gateway to the metaphysical realm is accessing that part that quantum part of your brain and getting out of the the ego consciousness which is just you know here and another thing that i think is interesting is it's like you notice what you've programmed yourself to notice so how do you program yourself it's through your belief system, yeah. right? And that's that's what I think the law of attraction kind of really is. And you know, magic is is tools for amplifying and 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 working with the law of attraction in a lot of ways. I think that you you program yourself with your beliefs, like that's your operating system. Yeah, I, absolutely true. And that's one of the things that I like about uh, working with the Goetic demons or the Kabbalistic angels. I feel like it allows you to focus on that one thing that you want to attract more of. Um, and it gives you a, a physical uh, manifestation of it to, to k- kind of visualize. Cause if you don't have that, I mean, you think in your head, I want to get rich. Well, what does that mean? You know, I want to be happy. I want to uh, fall in love. Well, with who, <laughs> you know, you got to give it a little bit, uh, a little bit more of a, a concrete, goal than just saying, I want this, or I want that and throwing it out in the ether and hoping it works. Uh, That's really why I like the Goetic Demons, because they give you that opportunity to see that concrete little creature uh, that, that embodies that thing that you're looking for. Have you read, um, there's a, let me get it here. This particular edition of the Goetia, I have not, but I've seen that on, on Amazon. It pops up in my, in my uh, Amazon uh, suggested items all the time. So, I highly so I'm recommend familiar it. with it. I highly recommend it. Okay. And the reason is that it includes, let me find it here. It includes an introduction by Alistair Crowley. Okay, nice. And that intro- that introduction is actually an essay called "The Initiated Interpretation: The Initiated Initiated Interpretation of Ceremonial Magic." Mm. And this little essay blew me away because it made some things make sense to me, right? Yeah. So I'm just going to read one little bit here, and this is Crowley writing. If then I say with Solomon, the spirit Chimeres teaches logic, what I mean is those portions of my brain which subserve the logical faculty may be stimulated and developed by following out the process called the invocation of Chimeres. So, you know, he's saying that the Goetic demons and the angels of the Shemham Parash are portions of your brain and portions of the human psyche. And that made so, so much sense to me <laughs> it really does it and it makes so much sense to a lot of people I, and i'll tell you what i actually um created a free online course called summon yourself and in the course i walk you through the 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 history of the ritual magic but also the process of summoning various demons and angels and i talk about exactly that concept 
where, you know, when I summoned uh, Lucifuge Rofical for the first time, uh, I summon, he's supposed to bring all worldly riches, like that's his thing. And I found myself getting really good at math and business concepts, stuff I never, mm-hmm. I was an actor and, and I was a sailor for, for eight years and an actor for most of my life. I didn't know shit about math or business. I mean, I couldn't even do my own taxes or anything like that. A balance sheet? No, I had no idea what that even was. And within a couple of months of doing that invocation to Lucifuge Rofical, I not only got really good at math, I got really good at business. I mean, it was, it was really, really uh, shocking to me and to the people around me. I remember I was at a Christmas party uh, last year and uh, it was for my husband's company. And I'm talking to this guy all night and his name is Seth, which happens to be my brother's name. And I thought, wow, this guy's really cool. I wonder what he does. He must be a marketing guy or something like that. So at the end of the night, I said, you know, what's your job in the company? And he said, I'm the chief financial officer. And I was like, really? And I thought to myself, every CFO I've ever met in my whole life has been boring and awful. And I just didn't even want to be around them. And this guy is a CFO and I found him so interesting and, and charismatic. And I, what I realized was he hasn't changed. This guy is a boring by the numbers kind of guy. <laughs> I'm the one who's yes. changed. Yeah. I'm the boring by the numbers CFO guy now. And I'm, I'm relating to this guy. And I, I felt like, oh, kind of gross. Like I'm an accountant now. Nah, nah, that can't be right. But that's what happened. You know, it, was a, it was a change in my personality and my skill set. Uh, I mean, really, really un- unbelievable. And it was all through the act of invocating um, uh, Lucifer Drifical. Ab- yeah, that absolutely. That's that's right in line with with my kind of theory about what's happening here when you perform magic. So we're each, you know, we're each sort of our own universe, yeah. okay? And we're all colliding with each other all the time. But we're each experiencing our own reality. Right now, when you perform ceremonial magic or magic of any kind, like I, like I said, I'm a chaos magician. I, I make a lot of sigils um, without a lot of ceremony involved. Right. Or right, I'll do right. tarot magic. Just I keep ceremony kind of to a minimum. It's just my style. I don't know, but my magic works great. It's, so it's actually the exact <laughs> way I, I work, too. Yeah. yeah. There, there's ritual and there's ceremony. You know, those are, yeah. are, are two different things. Yes. Ritual is very important to me, like the process of doing it and having it the same way every time. Very important to me. Right. But, right. you know, the ceremony I can kind of do without. Um, I uh, I so I have a very close friend uh, who is he, he's kind of a mentor to me in some ways when it comes to occult magic. And because he's been a ritual magician with the Golden Dawn for over 20 years, I think. And uh, he and I had never done any kind of rituals or anything like that together. But we did a, an invocation to Ak, the Olympian spirit of the sun. And uh, we did it together up on top of a mountain in the middle of a fucking 110 degree blazing hot day. And it was something else to go, sit through that, to stand through that ceremony uh in the in the heat with the sun blazing on us doing this invocation to the to the sun spirit uh while he's carefully reading out the the ceremony and performing all the movements all the steps everything it it was something else you know and i but at the same time that that is not my kind of magic it's i have respect for it. i enjoyed participating in it i learned a lot by by assisting him in that in that process but it 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 didn't it didn't scratch me where I itched. We'll put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to resonate with your, with the particular language of magic that you're interested in. And, you know, so kind of like what I think was happening here is when you perform magic, you are changing yourself and through changing the vibration of your own aura, you align yourself with your goals, with your intention for your, whatever magic you were doing, you change your own vibration to align it with those goals. And like, like you said, suddenly you're interested in, in bank speak, <laughs> you know, and suddenly it's fascinating too, because you change yeah. yourself through ritual magic. And that's, yeah. that's what's really going on and how magic works. It's just, you are, you're changing your vibration and aligning yourself with whatever it is you're trying to manifest. And it just points you right at it and, and powerfully. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah. So I'd love to hear about some of the experiences you had when making the occult tarot deck. So I, 
started designing this deck in 2017. It was uh, 2017 in the beginning was not a good year for me. It was one of the worst years of my life, actually. January, February, that time period was was bad. I was going through some pretty dark times. And I actually wanted to design a tarot deck based on uh, the paintings of Hieronymus Bosch, and which I now have just recently released. But I was sitting on my couch and had my laptop and I'm trying to look through these paintings and I thought, this is stupid. This is, this is a dumb idea. It's a good idea, but it, it just can't be executed right. And I just typed in the word demons or, or something like that into a Google search. And uh, the, the dictionary Infernal, the Infernal Dictionary came up with all the, the drawings of the Goetic Demon. And it didn't have all 72, but it had a bunch of them. And I thought, you know, somewhere in, my, in the back here of my mind, it, I recalled that I had already read about the Goetic Demons and I knew something about them uh, from when I had studied the occult back in whatever it was, 97, 98. And I actually found a notebook that I had that had a list of the demons I had handwritten out in like 2004 or something. So, uh, so this was information that was, had always been in me, mm-hmm. but I had never thought to act on it in any way. And as I read through the descriptions of the demons and reminded myself of what I had sort of forgotten, uh, it just all made sense, you know? So people often ask, you know, how were you, how'd you get the idea to do this in the first place? I, I don't have an answer. I was inspired to do it. It, it wasn't a specific event or, um, you know, I didn't read a book about it. I, I didn't see a movie about it. It wasn't anything specific that inspired me to do it or that, that directed me to do it. It just came from, from some place in all that information, like Albert Einstein hitting E equals MC squared. You know, he, he had that knowledge back here someplace, but he couldn't put it together. So, so the act of creation of it was, was one thing. And then when I started actually creating the, the cards themselves, you know, they're digital manifestations. They're just, they're just graphical programs on my, on my laptop. And actually creating the card of, of Andros, uh, the, the owl boy, owl headed, uh, uh, murdering uh, demon. There was something really hard about getting that card just right. I had a hard time getting the, the graphics to look exactly like I wanted. And if you look on, in the deck, there's like a blood splatter across that card. And I wanted that to look perfect. I wanted it to look like real blood was on that card as though, you know, uh, somebody working with with Andros got stabbed and then touched the card with blood on their hands. So it took me really a very long time to get that card right. And it was maybe like two or three in the morning by the time I, I had almost finished with it. And I thought, I, I got to go to bed. It's getting really late. So I shut down my computer. I go into the bedroom and I had this sense that there was something there. And I don't get that sense almost ever. I've had it just a couple times in my whole life. But I had this sense that there was something in the room with me. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just get into bed and, and that sense will go away. Well, I got into bed and the sense didn't go away. And I laid in bed for a while. I could not get to sleep because I could tell. It got to a point where I was like, there's something in here with me. And I swear to God, I saw a black, tall shadow. And it wasn't a shape necessarily like a man because I could see the wings on its back in the, in the shadow, like standing in the, in the, in the window. And I could see the shadow, the, the hump of the wings, just like an, an angel would have standing up, just like Andrus has. And I thought, that's Andrus in this, in this room right now. But I also realized something really important. I manifested that by creating the invocation, by creating the sigil, by all that stuff together, Mm-hmm. So I have control in this situation. I can be afraid. That that's perfectly fine. I'm, that's uh, that's a, I'm allowed to be afraid that yes. there's some some spirit in my in my room. But at the same time, I have control over this. And when I thought back to what that card or what that uh, uh, demon does, what its history is, what its name is, all that stuff about it, the facts about it, the truth about it, it disappeared. I, I looked again; it was just gone. And but that was a moment where I was like, okay, this deck is real. There's something here. Uh, I need to be very, very respectful of these cards as I'm creating them. 
And you know what? I never had any other problem with any other demon the whole rest of the time I worked on the deck. That was the only time that it was almost like they were saying, or, or I was getting a tap on the shoulder to say, Hey dude, this is for real. You can't, you can't mess around with this. And one of the good things that came out of that was my respect so um, profound and so evident to the people who, who see the deck that there are, you know, magicians out there who view these uh, deities as real spirits and they view them as real deities that they, you know, make sacrifice to and worship and pray to and everything else. And if I had not treated them with that level of respect, it would have been like, you know, I don't know, printing a new version of the Bible and saying to Christians, well, here, just take it because I made it. Well, you know, they have their own view of what, what their beliefs are and what God is supposed to be and what Jesus is supposed to be. And if you don't respect that, they're not going to take the materials that you've made for them. So because I had that level of respect for these, these entities as though they were real beings and real, real uh, spirits, the people who have, who have received the deck can feel that, you know, they feel that respect. They understand that this wasn't just a, a money grab or anything like that, that I really took the time to get to know these beings as I was creating the cards. Yeah. And you could, I mean, I could really feel that when I, when I got that box, I was, I mean, it's beautiful. The cards are beautiful. They feel great, but there is just a power that you could feel, yeah. you know, and, and I don't know a single person who has seriously worked with the Goetia that won't tell you don't mess with the Goetia. This right. is, this is very right. real. And if you're not ready for it, it's going to scare the piss out of you. And that's absolutely true. Um, you know, I, I would say that the, the, these are absolutely real spirits. You just got to have an understanding of, of something can be real and non-physical and very real, you know? Um, and I think it's interesting when you, you know, when you're working with them, how by working with them, this is my kind of theory of what's going on here. You're stimulating, like Crowley says, that part of your brain and your part of your brain will project that spirit into your physical Absolutely. space to tell you yeah. I'm here, we're doing this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, that's, it can also serve as a guide through that process. Yeah. And, and you can, you know, these, these are portions of your subconscious mind, that quantum computer that can teach you, they can teach your thinking mind things that you couldn't possibly know, or, or, you know, would take you years to learn otherwise. No, no. Definitely. I, you know, all, all of the magic that I do, I do on instruction from my spirit guides who I'm, I'm in pretty much constant contact with. And that's, and I have been ever since that, that awakening experience uh, in 2018 uh, I've, you know, they're always there and they're, and we're always in dialogue now. And it's just become my, my normal reality. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and, you know, I can, and I can feel what they're doing. So when I do tarot readings, for example, when I'm reading for a client, I know exactly what's going on, at least from my perspective. My spirit guides are talking to them. They're having a conversation. It's being relayed through me into the cards. And even when I'm giving my, uh, my explanation of what the cards mean to my clients, often I'm in a semi-channeling state and the information is just right. coming through me. Yeah. You know, um, See, that's where you are a superior and, and many other tarot readers are superior to me. So I'm great at designing cards and creating the cards and the system that goes into the cards because I understand it. Um, I have a real block when it comes to reading for other people. I can do it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty decent at it, but I really have a hard time looking at the cards and then honestly telling that, that client what those things are saying. Uh, I, I don't have the finesse of, of someone who's been doing it for a long time like you. Uh, where you can speak in their language through that channeling process uh, because their guide is telling you basically how they're going to be able to understand what you're saying. And my favorite way of doing a reading is I lay out all the cards. I know what everything says. I know exactly what the reading means. And now I've got to translate to them. And I start telling them kind of here and there, well, this is what this card means. I don't tell them how it applies to them. And what they do is tell me how it applies to them. Oh, that, that must be that, that thing, that new job I'll interview I just got or whatever. They're able to sort of fill in those gaps that I don't have the courage to jump out and say. 
Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's always got to be a dialogue with clients, and, and I don't always understand. Um, and I'll say that I felt exactly kind of the same way you did, uh, and then I, that's why I chose to start doing festivals. I'm I'm the kind right. of person like I okay, I'm scared. I'm going to dive yeah, head first yeah. and do a hundred customers a day. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I I would drop dead at the end of that. I I get exhausted reading for. I think I did a, a reading on Instagram uh, uh, last year, and I think I did maybe. 10 or, or 11 people or something like that. And at the end of it, I was spent. I mean, I was, yeah. I was just done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I definitely, I, I get that expenditure of energy, but I also get so much energy from my clients from, yeah. from just having yeah. the conversations. I, love I, I haven't to people. gotten that skill down yet. <laughs> yeah, That's why I'm not a professional reader like, like you. <laughs> yeah. It's great. I love it. I, I, I love talking to people and I love, re- and I love reading for them and I love, you know, just the, the connection that happens right. when you get to talk right. to somebody about spirituality, because yeah. it's something that I was raised completely not talking about it, mm. you know, and it's, I think many of us were or yeah, all, almost all of us. We are a three part system. You are mind, body, spirit. And if you completely ignore one of those three parts, you're damaging yourself. Then, you know, that's really how I feel. And so having restored that part of me and being in this process of restoring that part of me, it's, you know, it's a continual process forever, but it just feels so good. And I love sharing that with people. And so I love being a reader and I love finding that connection and I love getting skeptics. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, you know, or people who are just like, oh, I don't, I don't really expect much. And then it's like, wham, in your face, <laughs> which is how it, and especially, you know, I don't read for myself every day. I have two or three times a week is how often I'll read for myself. And then I also yeah. do a 12 card uh, spread on my birthday for the months of the year. And I do another 12 card spread on new year's. And then I combine those two and look at, so I'll have two cards for the month. And then I'll also do either a daily single card or if something profound comes up, often I'll be shuffling to do my daily single card and my guides will say, nope, it's three cards today. And then I pull three cards and it's like, oh man, this is a lot to process Wow. with whatever the message is or something. So I'll skip a day, you know, but I try, and are I try using to the, do you use the same deck for, for most oh my of God, your, no, your so personal decks. Okay. So you're using different decks for your own yeah. personal, um, personal work. Okay. So like, these are my favorites. I kind of have it here. I have the Crow Tarot, the mm-hmm. Santa Muerte, the Wild Unknown, and the Rackham Tarot. Uh, Occult Tarot is over there with my altar. Um, I've also got Thoth Tarot and Whiter, the Rider White Smith deck and a few others right. that I don't, I don't vibe so much with these ones I vibe with. And what happens is every day when I first, so like I said, <laughs> it's hard to explain what's been going on with me for the last couple of years. Cause I'm in constant communication with my guys and I'm always listening and they just tell me, go, it's time, go read your cards. And then I'll reach for a deck and they'll put my hand at the one that I should use for that day. And then I, I know I stop shuffling when they tell me to it's, that's just the relationship that we have. Um, so that's what I do. I mean, I just wait for them to tell me, go, go read your cards. This is what deck you use. Stop shuffling. Here's what you need to know. <laughs> It's so convenient. Nice. They're so good. Very me. convenient. <laughs> Very convenient. And and it's and it's always spot on and it's always profound. And I'm never confused by by the reading. It's always like, yep, totally. Yeah. Yeah. What what I noticed uh, a couple of people actually doing is using different decks. Like you basically would lay out a, a Celtic cross, we'll say, uh, having people use different decks for different parts of the cross. So like maybe the future cards come from one deck, mm. the past cards come from another. And then those cards along the side, uh, the, what's it, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now uh, those cards are yet from another deck. And I thought that's kind of a, a weird way to do things, but you might have different energies around different aspects of the reading. And so maybe for one, you know, you would want, you know, the occult tarot is probably not going to be good for some of your things but it might be all right for others you know you might want to mix and mix and match the cards like that it's kind of an interesting uh concept that i've seen people doing that is really interesting. i have not i have not tried it for myself yet there's like an ocd part of me that goes don't do that (laughs) (laughs) you know that's gonna make a mess (laughs) me too yeah me too (laughs) but if you know but that's the great thing about magic is it's it's so you just do what intuitively feels correct to you no matter how weird or crazy it is and you know you go with it and that's how you're going to get the best results um i I love i've never considered myself to be an artist you know at least when it comes to drawing of any kind but when i make sigils 
I lose myself in the process and just right. do whatever it is, weird thing that comes to me. And I, and I love the results, you know, it's yeah. abstract and it's weird and it's great. Yeah. Uh, it's not, it yeah, doesn't the, have to make sense. I, I uh, have, have tried to dive as deep as I can into the, the process of sigil creation um, that is not modern. I'm, I'm really interested in how did old occultists decide, um, you know, uh, Baal or Samaris or whoever, their sigils were going to look the way they do. And the books that discuss this art are all in Latin and they're in really old Latin. Mm -hmm. And as much as I have been able to translate for myself, I still can't connect those dots. There's little pieces missing that I think some of it is just inspiration. You know, as they were creating the sigils, they had the general idea of lines and crosses or, or circles or, you know, hooks, whatever little pieces are supposed to go in there. And then I still think that they were using a little bit of their own inspiration as they were creating them. And now we, we still use them today. And I could be wrong on that. I, I hope I am. I really want there to be like a, a roadmap I can follow to recreate these sigils on my own. But I haven't been able to find it if, if it exists at all. But that's a topic that I'm really interested in. And I've really tried to go back as far as I can in the, in the occult literature. And I've I've not really been able to find anything conclusive to my, to my satisfaction. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I've, I've thought that it would be really cool as an experiment to find somebody who's proficient in, let's say, um, remote viewing yeah. and see if they can back engineer a sigil. Mm. And yeah, say that, that's this, exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah, back yes. engineer and say, this is the intention of what you created here. And this is, this is the, the way you put that energy into it. That's right. That's yeah, right. That would be yeah. so, but I, I, I mean, that's, I wonder, is that wishful thinking? <laughs> uh, who, uh, we, there's one way to find out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. It would be a great yeah. experiment. I I'm fascinated by that kind of stuff. And you know, these people who are proficient at things like astral travel and remote viewing, many of them mm -hmm. report having the ability to look at different places in time. Right. Now, all of that makes sense to me as a term in terms of, you know, quantum physics and, and okay, well, if all time mm -hmm. really is simultaneous, and if consciousness is the fundamental element of the universe, then this theme seems theoretically possible to me, right. but I cannot astral travel yet. <laughs> it's not happened yet. I put a lot of energy into it. Uh, I know, yeah. I kind of know what's blocking me and it's my diet amongst other things, Right. you know, but I, I want to experience that and I want to see what it is that they're seeing. So the astral travel aspect of all this is part of my unified theory of metaphysics mm -hmm. um, and, and how we interact with time, both as conscious beings and as physical beings. And I sincerely believe that through the process of meditation, and it doesn't have to be guided meditation. In fact, if you're with other people, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, solo meditation by yourself in an isolated place if possible the longer and the deeper you can train yourself to go into those meditative states, you will uh, acquire the ability to, to travel astrally, to, to literally travel through time, not travel through time, to look through to time. Look through, yeah, absolutely. Way. Look through yeah. time. That's a, that's a better way to, to explain. And that. I feel like I've come so close to that experience a number of times. I, yeah. I mean, I've seen visions. I'm not the best at visualization. It's just something that's difficult for me. So I right. feel like that's a little added barrier for me personally mm -hmm. um but i i feel like that exactly what you're saying you know and meditation is meditation alone will change your life yeah. um yeah. that ability to go inward and to go deeply inward is is such a wonderful experience and it calms the chaos of your mind and it, it puts yeah. you into that you're yeah. you know you're you're existing in that metaphysical realm when you're in that deep meditative state you're there it might not look like anything, but you're in that state where your spirit guides can talk to you. You're in that state where you can have that conversation with the universe, you know, and, and right past that, <laughs> you know, I, I, it feels like that's where kind of astral travel begins. And it's, it's, again, it's a skill I definitely uh, aim to develop.
if you if you read the original accounts of like Buddha or the um, spiritual leaders that came before him, the Mahavira, for example, in the Jain religion, or Parsva, also in the Jain religion, um, these are three people who were real people. They existed, and they all achieved uh, enlightenment to to their degree that that they understood was enlightenment. And all three of them said. I was able to, I mean, basically the Buddha said he traveled the universe, mm -hmm. you know, he was able to, to see everything uh, all at the same time. And that's, all of them achieved it through just simple meditation, meditation. I mean, they had fasting and stuff like that. But it was, it was really through the process of solo meditation and yeah. they didn't rely on anybody else's uh, help or wisdom or guidance or anything else. They eventually went out and just had to do it for themselves. Every, and everybody can do this. And you know, what's funny yeah. is you will see a thousand and one videos on YouTube saying <laughs> how to open your third eye. Right, right. But opening your third eye and meditating are the same thing. Right, you just right. you just place your consciousness at that part of your brain and you let it be there and you go inward and that is exercising the muscle that is your third eye that is how it's going to open is by you going inward uh are you familiar yeah. with the emerald tablets of thoth the atlantean i am yes yeah, yeah. so i, 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 want, I want the guide yeah. the whole thing <laughs> Right. I'll actually tell you something real quick. I, it's not exactly connected to that, but maybe a little bit. I, when I was in the Navy, I was stationed in uh, Norfolk and in Virginia beach. And in Virginia beach is where the Edgar, Edgar Casey center is. Oh. So there are a lot of uh, unusual new age and spiritual mm -hmm. ideas and traditions and people that are out there. And it's a, it's a really fun community. It's a great community. Uh, they occasionally go even a little deeper than I am willing to, uh, to <laughs> put myself out there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> um, there, there's, there's places where I draw the line. Now, this isn't to say that anyone's wrong, but like I draw yeah. the line at reptilian aliens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, um, I actually had a, a psychic tell me that I was. You know, I used to work for a psychic company. I, I don't know if you knew that or not. Uh, as a recruiter, my job was actually to find people who had psychic abilities and recruit them to, oh, to work awesome. for us. So I had to get a ton of psychic readings. I mean, you have no idea how many. Yeah. And this one woman, she wanted to do a past life regression on me. And she said, your soul is, is, is reptilian. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound good. And she said, well, it's not actually reptilian, but it was brought here by the reptilian. I said, okay, well, that sounds a little better. <laughs> yeah. Now, again, I'm not saying that that stuff's not real. It's, it's just a language of symbolism that, I, that doesn't resonate with exactly. me personally. Exactly. You know, um, yeah. and, and also if, if they are out there, you know, when they land, I'll worry about it. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah. You know, until when I, then when I'm I not pull off put my, my when I pull off my face and and you're talking to a lizard, then you can be yeah. Worried. Then I'll be like, oh, <laughs> well, fuck. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, let's see what else did I want to ask you? Um, well, I, I mean, I wanted to ask you: Is there any one particular magical path that that you follow or you that resonates most with you? That's like the, the, what you're drawn to. <laughs> No, um, I have, I've always lived my life very idiosyncratically, you know, sort of doing things to, to my own path, to my own way. Mm -hmm. um, and I know found your that path number. I don't actually, no, oh, I, I, I know you talked about before I was going to get ready to look it up here after we're, we're done with <laughs> this, this talk, uh, because I am curious to see what it is. But what, what I find interesting is, you know, I look at my uh, we all have a, a specific goetic demon that we are connected to uh, mm -hmm. astrologically, just based on the day of our birth. Yeah. And the same thing with the angels. We all have certain angels we're connected to. And my, you look at who my, my, um, my, my demon is, it is, uh, what the hell is his, his goetic name? Well, I can't remember it offhand, but he's basically a demon of war and battles. And that's how he, he fights and he helps people fight. And, you know, when I went into the military, everybody said I was completely insane because I, I was in college and I just decided to drop out of college and, and literally join the Navy. You know, two weeks later, I was gone and everyone said I was nuts because I had never shown an inclination for anything physical or sports, or I wasn't a tough guy or anything like that. 
And I excelled in the military. It was like I had always been made to, to be there. And now I look back and I think to myself, you know, when I was like 15 or 16, if I had known that the military path was in my, my, my demon guide was, was in there, uh, would I have joined the military right out of high school? Who knows? Mm-hmm. You know, but, but I had no way of knowing that until I went back later and looked at the, uh, looked at uh, who my demon was. In the same way with uh, the, the angels, my three Kabbalistic angels, you know, one of them in particular, uh, Michel, is uh, he's the emperor in my, my Kabbalistic angel stack. He focuses on uh, politics and authority and government. And the image that I chose for that angel was this angel who is sort of a, he's like an emperor. He's wearing a Caesar's crown and he, he's bald. He's got a beard. He looks very regal. When I did that, I didn't know that that was my angel. I had accidentally fucked up the time of my birth and I was an hour off. So I thought my birth angel was someone completely different. And then just last year, my mother reminded me, oh no, dude, you were born at 1252, not 152. And I went back and I looked and I'm like, oh my God, the hell is not only my angel. Uh, I, it, you, I don't know if you know this or not, but I started my own country uh, about 20 years ago. It's called West Antarctica. Yeah, okay, so, I, so I saw I, that. <laughs> I, so I'm in government. Okay, I run mm-hmm. a country. Yeah. I'm, I'm freaking bald. I have got a, a beard. <laughs> I'm like, I could not have made a card for myself any more perfectly than if I had tried. It, it, it's absolutely unbelievable. It and is. so yeah. they're both like life path uh, 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 indicators, you know, one mm-hmm. is an angel, one's a demon, but still it just so happens that my life has followed those paths without me even trying or, or really knowing about it. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's so amazing how, when you find that sort of system or, or, you know, symbolic language that you resonate with, how the synchronicity is going to be so powerful. Right. It's unreal. Right. Um, you know, for me being a life path one and the magician and, well, guess what? This is what I want to do with my life <laughs> is be right. a magician and talk about magic and teach metaphysics. Right. And, and I've, I've had so much experience with synchronicity, even before I was taking occultism seriously. Um, my yeah. birthday is August 8th, for example. Uh, and so, and I, when I was born, I weighed eight pounds, eight ounces. Um, wow. Yeah. So I was kind of always tuned into That's like a lot a, of eights. <laughs> number patterns are a real thing. My brother, my older brother is born on seven, two, five and in numerology, which is reductive math that equals right. seven, seven. My son wow. was uh, March 16th or I'm sorry, March 6th, 2016. So he's three, six, nine. Wow. Yeah. And I, my best friend in the world, his entire family are 11s, either 11, 22 wow. or 33. They're, they're an incarnated group of master numbers. Wow. It's so fascinating. And that's, yeah. that's the great thing about learning this stuff, especially with astrology and numerology, is you really, really start to see the patterns. It's not all yeah. in your head. The patterns are very real. And yeah. you'll start to notice, oh my God, all of my friends are life path nine. All of my <laughs> friends are cancer, you know, yeah. or yeah. I can't. All my friends have the exact same birthday. Yeah. Or if you're a Leo, guess what? You're not going to be best friends with the Scorpio. It's not happening. Right, right. You know, or if yeah. you are, it's going to be like an abusive friendship. <laughs> These things are real <laughs> and they're profound. And they, and you can learn so much about yourself in the world through embracing these symbolic languages because they're describing yeah, real phenomenon yeah. Yeah. And, and and by learning that stuff you know you can start to take control of your of your situation and of your life and, and of your mind be, yeah uh, d- your mind is everything really yeah. and if you can if you can control what's going on in here you, you're already one step ahead of almost everybody else in existence i think <laughs> that when you learn astrology and numerology it rewires your brain and organizes it, it in a certain way yes. and and you're like okay i get it now I'm yeah, moving through does. the world differently than I, I had been. Absolutely. Yeah. No. You know, I, that, I may have, uh, I may have changed careers much earlier if I had really paid attention to this stuff, for example. Right. You know, uh, I may have been doing this for much longer than I, you know, I'm just, I feel like I'm playing catch up now because this is what I should have been doing my whole life. You know, I, people have actually, uh, trying to suggest that with me because I've, I've done quite a few different things with my life and I'm 40 now. And I, I feel like I've discovered what I am meant to be doing, mm-hmm. uh, at age 38 or 37. It's, it's pretty late in life, really. 
And, but I look back at all the other things I did and, you know, if I had not done those things, I don't think I would be as successful as I am right now. And, And let me explain why. Well, you know, all those years I spent as an intelligence analyst in the Navy, you know, I was analyzing um, orders of battle, like how many missiles does Iraq have or how many submarines does Iran have or stuff like that. And if you look at that research ability and that analytical ability, I've applied it to the Goetta and to the Tarot and to all these old occult manuscripts. And you clearly astro- have, yeah. You're- to the astrology behind it and the Kabbalistic angels and the Hebrew that goes into that all that stuff together to analyze it as though it were, you know, foreign uh, 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 military. Mm -hmm. I I could have never done that without having that experience already um, that I had in the military and the ability then to communicate it. Okay. So I've got the ability to do the research for myself, but to communicate it, you know, I was a professional actor for seven years. I could have never been able to communicate all that material without understanding the nuances of human communication mm-hmm. and, and writing and art and, and expression and being a free enough to express myself, yeah. uh, which I learned through, through many years of acting classes, which were otherwise not very productive. <laughs> yeah, one of the um, messages that my guides have shared with me is that you plan out your life before you're born. Mm. Uh, you know, not every moment of it. Like you come here with like a general battle plan. Like, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I need to do to get where I need to be. Here are the experiences I need to have, you know, and that's, again, like, I feel like when you build your character from the other side and you're planning to come to the earth realm, you're, you're planning out your astrology and you're, you're creating this psyche that's going to have these experiences that are going to accomplish this thing. Right. So, and you don't know that you're, you're going along the path just like when you're playing a video game, you know, your character has no idea what's going on. You're just making them do stuff, <laughs> you know, so you're, you're moving along this path. And if you, you kind of have, it helps me so much to have faith in these kind of ideas. Like sometimes I don't know what I'm doing, but I have faith that my guides are triggering me Pointing you in the right I direction. To have, yeah, yeah. To, to yeah. accomplish what it is that I'm here to accomplish. Right. You know, whatever that may be. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, sometimes you don't really discover that until, until it's already happened and you can mm-hmm. look back and say, ah, that, okay, that, that's all right. That's what I was supposed to do. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. Right. Like you're never going to know until you're there. You yeah. can speculate all you want, but it, it's, it's interesting because you have to kind of give up control and go with the flow, but you have to have, you have to have direction. Absolutely. It's a really, really delicate balance to allow um, uh, unexpected things to to influence you in a positive way and not take everything as an obstacle just because you didn't see it coming. You know, you have to be willing to, to take those unexpected things and incorporate them in, in what you're doing. And, and maybe it'll work out in a way you never imagined, which is that's been my personal experience mm-hmm. for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and you can, you know, when you're tuned into this this kind of this, these patterns and this kind of information you can use synchronicity and like okay this synchronicity i'm going to follow to the next synchronicity to the next synchronicity and you've got like you know, yeah. you connect the dots as you're moving through life in that way and it's, that's been tremendously helpful to me is kind of always seeing sort of being able to discern what's coming next and where what kind of angle i need to be at um, right. Yeah, so that pretty much covers all the questions I had. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, man. Thank you very much. This has been great. Um, yeah, I, I very much enjoyed it. Yeah. I don't I, often get to talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, usually when I get calls for interviews or appearances or stuff, it's for West Antarctica. They all want to know why I claimed uh, part of Antarctica. And honestly, I've, I've talked about that so much. I, I'm pretty bored with it. I find the occult and um, all the, that knowledge I've gotten, that research I've done to be so much more interesting. But more importantly, you know, you, a person like you who's been doing it for, for probably even longer than I have uh, has so much that you can teach me you know, and I can still get get something out of out of the exchange. So, yeah, I love I love talking about this kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's why I kind of my, in my I, everyone has their own karma. OK, and, and everyone's yeah. at the level of consciousness they're at. But I want to spread this stuff. I want to spread it around because it's useful and it's fun and it's fun to talk about. And you can, 
magic works. You can make things happen in your life. Yeah. And it's, and it's wonderful to, to have these conversations with people that have had these experiences and say, man, wasn't that great? And get to kind of be in on that because if you're not in on it, you're not in on it. Yeah. You know? And I want to get more people in on it and, and expose yeah. them to how much fun this can be and, uh, and how cool synchronicity is, you know, and that you can develop, you know, you're in a relationship with the universe, whether you realize it or not, even if you're an atheist, like you're in it, you're in the universe, right? right. You're right. in here, right. <laughs> form a relationship with it. You know, yeah. you're a part of it. Just like a, you know, like a single cell organism in your own body is a part of you. Mm-hmm. You're a part of the universe, you know? And I, and I think that we're gonna, you know, the next stage in science is just acknowledging, not even discovering, acknowledging that the universe is a living conscious organism. Right, right. You know? Yeah, there's, there's, there's so many things about it that resemble our own inner cellular mm-hmm. life. You know, you can explode that out to the, to the size of the universe. Yep. How can you say it's not got something there that we aren't able to, to grasp? And that thing may well be consciousness, who knows? I, I think so. I think it is the, the connecting factor, uh, the unifying, uh, the, the unifier. The Unifies, unifier. Unifying theory of metaphysics, as I say. And, and of all <laughs> Of, of, every, of all reality and all right, realities right. are are yeah. fundamentally based on consciousness because what else you need to be conscious to, conscious to be aware of any of it and what you're aware of is consciousness it's right exactly i mean it's yeah. a mirror it's all the universe is a mirror and and fractal mathematics are kind of pointing right at that you're a fractal image of the universe the microcosm and the macrocosm are mirrors of each other right I'm actually, it's funny you mentioned fractal ma- mathematics. I'm actually in the process of reading Jurassic Park. It's, it's one of my favorite movies, but I've never read the book. It's my and I just, <laughs> I, I decided to start reading it just uh, a, a few days ago. And, you know, he, he talks about fractals in every, at the beginning of like every chapter, or every section. And I had never, I don't know a whole lot about fractal mathematics. I know a little bit. Um, physics is sort of more what, where my interest level is, but it, it was piquing my interest to the point where I'm like, I think I need to read a couple books about this because there's, there's definitely some overlap with, with the occult and the metaphysical and things that I'm already interested yeah, in. Yeah, man, definitely research sacred geometry. And um, there's a physicist, Nassim Harriman, who's, mm-hmm. you know, he's an award-winning physicist who's fully into this stuff. And, right. and talks all about it. And he has some really interesting theories. I think he has his own unified field theory, um, you know, and it, and it revolves around sacred geometry right. and fractal mathematics. Hey, you know, a lot of physicists are. Jack Parsons mm-hmm. was, was uh, founder of JPL, was humongously interested in the occult. And Jack and Parsons, Crowley, yeah, uh, he was. <laughs> yeah, he, he and Crowley did. Him did and L. Ron together. Hubbard. <laughs> yeah, and L. Ron Hubbard, yep, yeah. yeah. I've yeah. actually been to in Los Angeles. There's a spot you can go. It's near where, where JPL is today in Pasadena. Um, there's a spot you can go called the Devil's Gate. Mm-hmm. And this is the place where they did a lot of their rituals. Mm-hmm. And uh, Crowley and Parsons and, and Hubbard and, and a few others too, who I, who I don't know their names. But to go there, there's a definite energy there. And my friend, he really wants to do a ritual there. And he's done a couple by himself. And I'm like, dude, are you crazy? <laughs> But, do you think you that were, Hubbard was possessed by a demon under the influence I mean, of a goetic? I mean, I, I, it, it would certainly not surprise me. You know, I, I think he had a transformative uh, experience at some point uh, early in that process yeah. for him. And it was not a positive experience. I agree. You know, I, I think it was like a, a bad, a bad acid trip or a bad mushroom trip. And whatever that was attached itself to him and it never left. I, I really do believe that. I believe that too. Absolutely. It, it falls yeah. in line. Even the, the things he came up with are yeah. right in line with it. That He was under the influence. And, and, you know, when I say under the influence of a goetic demon, I mean, he, he was friends with Aleister Crowley. They performed these rituals together. He did this intentionally. Right. I mean, he had, yeah. he had a goal. He wanted yeah. to start a cult and he used magic work to help him get there and it and this is the test of the power of Asia. because <laughs> yeah. he started a cult that convinces the world's richest people to give him all their money yep. come on <laughs> you know um yeah. so that's the power of these things when you if you're at that you know 
like I said, everyone's at their own level of consciousness and karma, and that's right where they're supposed to be. Another one of the things that my guides have shared with me is that there's really no um, battle between good and evil. It's, those it's, are constructs, spectrum, you know, that's, you know? that's the yeah. way that we interpret things, whether yeah. it's good or evil, you know, uh, right or wrong, helpful or hurtful. They're, it's how th these things uh, appear to us. So it's our constructs. It's, yeah. it's not, it's not reality the, at all. The way I, I try to explain yeah. that to people about the goetic demons, you know, you look at what their abilities are. And for the most part, the demons are all helpful. They do nice things. Well, They're it has everything to do with your intention. They'll help you a absolutely. with whatever it is absolutely. you want to do. And yeah. it's your yeah. intentions that are so, that are important. They're and not going to, exactly they're not going to hold right. you back. Yes, that's exactly yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's powerful stuff. Um, yeah. I haven't, you know, the, I, the, the work I've done with the Goetia has been exclusively through your deck and I've oh, found wow. it to be incredibly powerful. Jeez. Okay. Yeah, oh my goodness. Yeah, um, <laughs> wow. I, oh, wow. That's like, holy cow. What a compliment. <laughs> well, I mean, it's such a wonderful tool for working with the Goetia. Thank you. I mean, you, you put Thank them you. on cards. That's exactly yeah. what kind of needed to be done. It's kind of like the evolution of the Goetia, right. in fact, is to put them right. into a tarot deck. I mean, yeah. a specific deck of tarot cards. And I'm excited yeah. to get a copy of the uh, Angel Tarot as well. Um, it's it's great. Honestly, it's got all the same power. You know, the I, I really believe that the, the Angel Tarot is the... How do I put this? Um... You know, like when Walt Disney created Disneyland, well, he had done a lot of other stuff too. He had made movies and, and, and done all these other things that involved cartoons, but Disneyland and Disney World, like that was his, his thing, his good thing that he left to the world. Mm -hmm. I feel like the Angel Tarot the, and the, the Angel Evoking Tarot, as it was originally called, is like the one good thing that I have given to the world. I have lots of other great stuff out there that I like and that is useful and that is beautiful and nice, but this is the thing that actually will raise people's vibrations to a higher level and get their intentions going uh, upward rather than, than in a depressed or a horrible place. You can be in the worst mood on planet earth. You do a reading with that deck. It's impossible for it not to come out in a positive way. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Really. It gives me the chills every time I, I use it or do a reading for, for somebody else. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's right. I, I want to check that so out. So you'll love yeah. it. It's, it's fantastic. It's just like the occult tarot, but the energy is just at such a high vibrational frequency. It's, it's really beautiful. That's awesome. Um, so what I gathered from some of your videos today is that your books are just like gone. Like you can't get a copy anymore. Well, um, that is partially true. So the first editions were all limited editions. I, I decided to do that for a really specific reason. Um, the Grimoire of Dark Souls is the first uh, uh, Grimoire that I wrote. Yeah, I really and want to get a copy of that. <laughs> so, so just owning a copy, if if you happen to be Catholic, is actually uh, an excommunicable offense because of the material that's in it. And I know that probably makes you want it more. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, I, I I actually have, have two copies here in my in my house. But uh, regardless, so the. It, it's really not for the faint of heart. It's not for, um, I didn't want to make it available en masse so anybody could have it mm -hmm. because it's, it's just not safe, you know? And, and I, I would not be a responsible magician if I, if I did that. Yep. Um, the, the, the second book then the Anjanomicon, which is a book of angel magic, mm -hmm. actually most of that material has been put into the third book, which is called the Grimoire of heaven and hell. And those first editions are sold out, but you can actually buy that book on my website, which is bloodstone. Oh, awesome. And that's a great book because what it does is combines all the Kabbalistic and Goetic uh, spirits in one big fat book. So all their invocations are in there, the information and sigils for every single demon and angel are in there, their astrological connections. So you can look and see, oh, who's the angel that ruled over my day, my hour, my week or whatever. Um, and the same thing for the demon. So that book is, is really the most useful grimoire that I have created. And yes, that is available. I, I still own the rights to that. I've not, you know, my, my occult tarot, my angel tarot, 
I've licensed those out to Rockpool Publishing. Mm -hmm. So they handle all those, those new editions of those cards. Um, but the uh, Grimoire of Heaven and Hell, I still have the rights to that myself. So oh, I'm, I'm still privately, privately printing that and you know, handling quality yeah. control and all that stuff. So yeah, do, it's, it's do you ever good. plan to uh, do any new editions or a reprinting of the uh, the grimoire of what is it the grimoire of uh, uh, the grimoire of dark souls dark souls uh, yeah. we'll see you know i don't know maybe in uh in i can send you a pdf of it how's that is that better than no yeah i'd love that i would love <laughs> okay. that okay um, i'll send you a pdf i um, actually even have the last known i, I had 77 copies printed on aged parchment uh distressed and then hand bound i saw that in uh, your video it's beautiful yeah so i i have one of those copies left that i keep for myself and um I, it's it's i i have a hard time even picking it up and again it's my freaking book but the information is all comes from these old old grimoires yeah. and, and has been collated into one place so it's just like all this evil or or again evil and, and good are constructs it's all you know, this uh, I, I think it's kind of lower energy uh collated in one place personally i think that you know in this language of symbolism what we're really talking about is left brain right brain yeah lower yeah, chakras upper that. chakras right right you know they're diff yeah. they're not it's not you know people who are who are evil in one person's opinion well they think you're evil it's it's a point of view now personally right. guess what i have never personally hexed or cursed anyone and i never will it's just not who no, i am um i have a good friend that does it for money though and she's she's wow. a fantastic magician and you know she's in the revenge business and she's good at it wow. that's her business <laughs> we're good friends um but it's not something i do um you know that's just but i'm not condemning anyone who does it it's just that's not my vibe that's all I, i'm all about like i said witchcraft for better mental health and i think that if you're talking about better mental health to me right. that means getting out of that low vibrational state absolutely yeah i have i have one quick story about that uh, i did not intentionally do this okay it was completely mm -hmm. accidental I was doing um, the ritual of the seventh gate, which is how you, it's sort of the full way to use the occult tarot yeah. in an invocation where you're invocating every single card that comes out, every demon. And it's extremely powerful. And that, that, that's the thing. That that's sounds the thing I, dangerous. I do once a year. It, it can be, it can be. You're invoking well, all of those goetic entities at once at once well one actually, buddy you're yeah. crossing the streams man <laughs> I, I i'm aware believe me and that's the thing i i'm only willing to do once a year by the yeah. way i should have clarified that so i only do one reading a year with that deck yeah. i actually only do one of those gotcha. kinds of readings right. per year so i did this on halloween of 2007 and halloween and walpurgis night are the two uh, times that to to do these these rituals are are the absolute most powerful mm -hmm. times yep. so anyways i do this reading and this ritual and the demon uh harry's comes out or howries and his talent is to burn one's enemies and so when I saw that card come out I just thought to myself man I hate my boss he I can't stand him he's the only enemy I've got well, listen, this guy was a 15 year veteran employee at my company. Okay. He'd been there for 15 years. And the next day he had uh, uh, termination proceedings initiated against him and he fought it. it. Took him a month. They finally, finally let him go. Can you imagine that? The next day it started and it took a month to actually manifest. And I didn't want that to happen. I didn't intentionally ask for it. But that was the card that came out. That was the thought that popped in my head and boom, a day And later, once you've formed that happened. connection to the other side, you've got to be careful with it. Because Absolutely. once you're plugged in, you're plugged in. Hey, I, I, I paid for it, okay? It was, uh, <laughs> I, like I said, 2017 was a tough year for me. Yeah. Uh, I, I paid for, for that pretty, pretty dearly over the next couple months in other ways. And again, all that was in the, in the cards. I, I knew what was going to happen. I saw it coming. I thought, oh, Jesus, this is how the rest of my year is going to go. And it's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to, to understand that and to see what that give and take is, 
then it's okay to move forward. But if you're not, and you're not comfortable with it, then I, I don't recommend doing it. And like I said, I've done it basically two, three times in my entire life. I, it's not something I take lightly. Yeah. You know, I feel like there's kind of, there's always a higher level of understanding, right? To pretty much all these esoteric lessons. And that's kind of the wonderful treasure hunt that you're on. So, you know, one of, there's an old saying, I forget what, if it's from the Goetia or another book, it says magic will give you the power to destroy your enemies, which is true. You, You can destroy your enemies with magic. But to me, the higher understanding of that phrase is that magic can give you the understanding that you have no enemies, have no enemies exactly that yeah, we're all exactly, that we're right. all one that we're all connected yeah. in and yeah. in that understanding your enemies <laughs> are destroyed instantaneously because that's you right. realize that they're portions of you and, and that's why when that card came out my first thought was well i have no enemies and then like the stupid stay puff marshmallow man the <laughs> boss pops into my head and next thing you know the poor son of a bitch is fired and and uh, i mean i didn't like the guy so i was happy about it but at the same time i was like Damn, man, that's rough. <laughs> it's you know I've had okay. I know I don't think I've ever hurt anyone with that. I know I never have, but it was experiences like that that I had as a teenager that freaked me. It was I was in such right. awe of the power of it yeah. that I would be like, yeah. "Yo, I'm not doing this again yeah. for six months," <laughs> you know, or whatever yeah. it is. And, and, and you know what? That's the exact same experience that I had too. I'm extremely careful with it, and i I feel. Um, I feel comfortable working with angels and demons, but I get that a, a slightly better lift out yeah. of. Out well, because everybody has all of them inside of us. Yeah, you know we, we're yeah, all. That's the, the way secret. I see it yeah. is that everybody has these. So this is kind of where I'm getting into my own theories here, right? But I feel like the 72 goetic demons are portions of the right side of your brain, and the mm-hmm. angels of the Shemham Harash are the left side of your brain. Yeah. And we could also express that as lower chakras and upper chakras, right? But so everybody has all of them inside of you. And, and like the, the knobs on a guitar amplifier, they're just turned up to different volume levels. Right. Right. Like right. everyone has the entire Zodiac wheel within them and all the planets yeah. just expressed at different volume levels. You know, uh, a yeah. Leo is all sunshine. Uh, a Scorpio right. is... Yeah the mariana trench (laughs) Um, but there everyone contains all these things right i'm leo and scorpio so those are the two i always go to because they're they're square to each other you know and i I experience that conflict that inner conflict all the time my sun and moon are both leo and my ascendant is scorpio oh wow i kind of have that inner conflict all the time between leo and scorpio they don't like each other (laughs) um yeah, and I have, I have some weird, we could save that for another conversation, but I have some weird yeah. ideas about <laughs> astrology and, and how it works. Like yeah. some, you know, some updated ideas, things I want to toy around with. Oh, well, we can, we can talk about that next time. I'm actually yeah. trying to do a thing on the Egyptian, the original Egyptian decans, uh, which of mm-hmm. course is how our, our modern astrology is sort of pulled from those in a way. And I'm trying to really uh, drill down on those and get a better understanding of uh, it's not a one for one uh, match to, to no, the astrological not. systems we use today. I believe, but I want to see how close I can get Constellational astrology. You know? They were. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah. So it's not tropical astrology. So they're going right. to, they're going to have different, not each sign is going to be at even 30 degrees of the zodiac right, right. yeah, that's yeah. I, i'm trying to find a way to finesse that to make it uh, understandable to the average person because i don't even completely understand it myself yet yeah so that's that's one of the the projects i'm, I'm working on here right now so that's that's a great uh conversation for another another time yeah definitely all right man well it's been really great talking to you thank you yeah. so much um yeah let's keep in touch all right sounds um, good let's do this again another time have a good one all right sounds good see ya